I'm Spencer. I'm an engineer here at Temporal on our SDK team. Mostly work on our uh, core library written in Rust that all of our newer SDKs sit on top of, all the ones that aren't Go in Java. Uh, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we uh, had a fun project to send Temporal into space. One of the fun things about working at a startup is, you know, you get unexpected requests for fun things sometimes, and, and this was definitely one of them. One of our designers, Candice, came to me one day and asked, hey, Spencer, how would you feel about writing some code to send Temporal into space? I was a little, you know, curious. It's, it sounded fun, so I agreed. And it turns out what that meant was we're going to put a Raspberry Pi on a weather balloon and send that into space and have it be running a Temporal worker to show off how robust and fault tolerant Temporal is. I only had about a week to do it. <laughs> and uh, all I really knew about what was going on was that we were going to use Raspberry Pi and that somehow there'd be some kind of sensor attached to it over USB that would tell us things like GPS coordinates and altitude measurements and, and that sort of thing. And really all I had to work with was, was that information and a little sample text file with the data that was supposed to be produced by that device. So with that, I kind of I kind of dove right in. You know, a realistic choice here would have been to just do something like send a signal back to Temporal Cloud every so often with some of that data. Oh, but that's not as fun. It would have been cooler to run an actual Temporal worker and, you know, show off that we can recover from losing a connection and, you know, that all this stuff actually works in space, which would be great. And so that's sort of exactly what I did. So if we look at this code here on this left-hand pane, we've got some Python that defines an activity and a workflow. And the workflow is quite simple. It just runs this activity every five seconds. And then what the activity does is it reads some data from a queue, which we'll talk about in a second, you know, parses, parses out the data and then returns that. And the act of returning it means that we'll have written down that data to the event history and temporal. And so that way we can go, you know, we can go look at the workflow in the UI and you can see, you know, the GPS right there from the temporal UI. So yeah, well, like, what is this queue? Where does the data actually come from? You know, it's pretty straightforward. When we start at the program, we uh, fire up this queue. We start this USB sensor data class, which is over here on the right-hand side. And then I just, I start a little thread that runs this write data periodically function. And that uh, connects to the provider, which is in this case is the USB device. It's this thing, gets the available data and breaks it apart line by line because it, it turns out that that's how the, how the data came in was just as text line separated. And then while that thread is running, we start the temporal worker and that just goes on forever. Then the actual data parsing was, you know, like you often expect when working with devices in the real world is not in the nicest format. <laughs> so there's a little bit of logic here to, you know, deal with parsing parsing that and then using a very nice library available in Python called Serial to actually read from the USB device. And as you can see from this leftover comment, I had no idea what the right settings for connecting to that were. And luckily, even though I only had about an hour to test this out in the real world with the time difference of, uh, it turned out that these settings mostly just worked. <laughs> so that was pretty lucky. And we got a chance to see that the sensor data actually came across USB in this Reddit properly with the caveat that for whatever reason, the way that, that device happened to work, it required to be uh, physically reconnected every time you started reading from it. We had to make sure that the guys who were doing the actual launch understood the procedure that they needed to reconnect the device right before running my program and launching it in space. But it turned out that that, that all worked just fine. And, and the funny thing about developing it is I, I sort of knew Temporal would work. I mean, you know, I've been working on it for a long time. We designed Temporal to be very robust. I wasn't worried about that. I was, I was worried about the USB thing and maybe it just crapping out on me. But luckily that all that all came together and the launch did exactly what we wanted to do. We got to see it go off the ground. We got to see it lose connection. We got to see it reestablish connection and have all this stuff keep working and have temporal support support functioning in a, in a more difficult environment than you would typically experience. And that's it. So we were at a leadership offsite. Claire Bird, our new CMO, was workshopping our keynote. Everyone was very serious. There was a lot of engineering conversations happening about what we were talking about and what ideas we could have. I thought about maybe just pitching the absolute dumbest thing, which was we should maybe find two consenting tardigrades and put them in a vial and send them up into space to launch you know, our mascot and to kick off our, our keynote. And as I was pitching this, I looked at Max and I said, we know about long running workflows, have you heard about long distance workflows? And let me tell you, Max's face, he looked at me and was like, that is not how workflows work. <laughs> it was pretty awesome. I was actually in the room when this happened. And like there was, it was like the, all this serious conversation about like, you know, explaining how, you know, multi-region failover, you know, things like that. And, uh, and then- Very real engineering conversations. 
Oh, exactly. Right. And then Candice, just the look on your face as you were just like, I've got an idea. It's a launch. Come on. Tardigrade. Space. Launch. Do it. And uh, yeah, I remember you saying like long distance workflows. And yeah. that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like, come on. What? Maybe we should do this. Okay, we're totally doing it. Well, I'm glad we didn't settle for just the marketing shtick. I like, I'm glad we're like, no, if we're gonna do this. Let's actually run some code. So I was, I was pretty impressed that we were able to like technically run something up in space in that short amount of time. That was pretty awesome. Yeah, and as far as tight deadlines go, making something run on a little pie and putting it up into the atmosphere was, was a pretty fun thing to, to have to do. I mean, this would be a pretty awesome way to do like weather observations where you could just launch something like this that just floats and collects. And whenever it happens to get some internet service, it, you know, phones home. Like I, I could see like a real application of Temporal doing this because it, it's oh, like, yeah. it's like internally managing all the data and durably connecting back whenever it can. Absolutely. I mean, I think I mentioned in the little like tech explainer part that, I mean, in, in reality, you'll probably just do that by like sending signals to cloud because like running a whole worker on the thing like isn't strictly speaking necessary. It's just, it's cool and it demonstrates that the stuff works. You could do exactly what you're saying by just sending signals and that would work really well and it like it would look, you know, it would look good. I mean, I think it would be great for NASA. Like, you know, hey, you're sending something out and you don't know when you're going to have line of sight again. About it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they it's kind of like the whole value prop of Tempore, right? I mean, they have to do all that same kind of stuff their own way right now. So one thing I was noticing about the, this video is like, it's kind of weird, like the cape is just not moving, even though there's a fair amount of motion going on. Like that's fabric, did it like freeze or what's what's going on there? Yeah, well, there's a, there's no atmosphere anymore up that high. So there's there's nothing to push the cape around. <laughs> it's in space. Right, because space, because we went space. to space. It's in space. <laughs> the, yeah, fashion and accessories in space. At least it's, you know, and I'm, I'm sure it's functional. It's a space cape. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's sparkly. You can tell it's a space cape because it's sparkly. So I own multiple space suits for obvious reasons. When we were talking about sending Z up into space, I cut off the sleeve of one of my space suits to make him a little, uh, a real space cape. Wait, seriously? That is a, that is a space suit sleeve cape? Uh, that is a space suit sleeve cape that's for Z. <laughs> what I loved is we're waiting for the footage to come back. Like we got half the footage and we're like, where's the footage of Ziggy coming down? The company's like, oh, our camera didn't work. It stopped working halfway through. So it's really hilarious that Temporal totally worked fine. The equipment that they use all the time to go to space actually stopped working. Yeah, it was definitely really, really fun to see uh, the stuff we got to work on work flawlessly. Well, the, you know, the camera, which you really kind of wouldn't expect to break is, is what broke. Where did it end up landing? You can see on the GPS there. Wait, this was, it was in Britain, right? Yeah, the team that recovered it had a GPS and we're totally tracking it. And Ziggy crashed through some trees and they had to find Ziggy in a field. We saw it start to send the data like before it hit the ground, like like it got back into, into range of the cell towers. At that point, it started flushing the stuff it hadn't been able to send. 